world's deadliest animal apocalypse. Ladies and gentlemen, whether we recognize it or not, each and every one of us are in the midst of a war, a great controversy, a cosmic conflict, a supernatural battle between good and evil. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. There is only one city in the world that sits on seven hills like this, one major city, and that's the city of Rome. So there is no doubt in most expositors' minds that when John is talking about this woman, he is talking about Rome. It is within the city of Rome, called the city of seven hills, that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. When the Western Roman Empire fell, their territory fragmented into 10 primary divisions. The 10 horns represent the 10 kings or kingdoms into which Imperial Rome was eventually split. The 10 horns are a description of Rome, which breaks up into 10 smaller kingdoms.
The names of blasphemy is another key element to this prophecy that points directly at the Roman Catholic Church. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. This puts a mortal man in a position of God and is ultimately the very definition of blasphemy. This is not meant to question the sincerity of any specific pope, but the prophecy is addressing the office that he holds and the institution he represents. There is only one church that is also an independent country and has political world power, the Vatican. This country with the world's smallest population was established as an independent state with 109 acres within Rome. Behind the walls of Vatican City, there are less than 1,000 people living within this small country that is governed by the Pope who has absolute executive, legislative, and judicial powers. Ambassadors from around the world meet with the Pope and his representatives, seeking the influence and guidance of this international religious power. Even the United Nations will assemble to be addressed by the Pope.
And it's also very significant that when he was elected pope, the very next night, Francis also had a, some kind of a mystical experience that uh, transformed him almost into a different person. Now we have a picture we'd like to bring up on the screen showing the before and the after, you know, just like a, you know, a woman that loses weight, you've got the before and the after picture. Well, look <clears throat> at this. Uh, th this cardinal, before he became pope, was not known as a sanguine, happy, social, friendly, charismatic man. Uh, he was quite, quite different. And so Benedict resigns because of this, this mystical experience. Lightning strikes the Vatican, and then the new pope is elected. He has an experience where he then becomes almost a different person. And his sister, there was a, an article in a Catholic publication where his sister was interviewed, his only surviving sibling. And she said, I don't even recognize this guy. Hmm. He has been transformed into a different kind of person. And now he is really on the move and the popularity of Francis is just, it's off the charts. Does. It's like a giant software program that lets us not work together. Not, not work. Right. Not work, but we're in deep economic trouble here, too. Yes. And if we take one day off a week, that's 14% of our economy, right? Does God want us to go deeper into debt? I mean, he, he rested, but he doesn't have to pay China back. Well, there's that. But... So do you... Do you, think, do you think that we should be Sabbathing again? Because we don't Sabbath much anymore. So, I think we should, but I don't think we have to do it in churches and synagogues. There has to be a overarching idea of what the Sabbath is. Because if you Sabbath your Sabbath and I Sabbath my Sabbath, we're never going to co-Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> but we can co-Sabbath at the same time. We can Sabbath at the same time. I say make we it at don't, the same though. time. You Sabbath on Saturday and I Sabbath on Sunday. So and this, never the twain shall meet. So this is one of the weird things in the book. I am Jewish, but I, I, I say I think we should probably go back to protecting Sunday, actually. Really? Yeah. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but one of the things I argue in the book is one of the ideas, the political ideas sort of embedded in the Sabbath is the idea that as a society we have the right to take control of our time and say maybe as a democratic society we want to decide to bring back some rules about what 
can and cannot be done one day a week. And we might want to start thinking about ways mm -hmm. to encourage people not to work on that day. Now, probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That was Senator Sylvia Allen yesterday talking about the possibility of forcing people to attend church. Uh, I made a remark about uh, America's in a need of a moral rebirth. Man, as the image of God, is also called to rest and to celebrate. The account of creation concludes with these words, and on the seventh day God finished his work which we had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which we had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. For us Christians, the feast day is Sunday, the Lord's Day, the weekly Easter. It is the day of the church, the assembly convened by the Lord around the table of the Word and of the Eucharistic sacrifice, just as we are doing today. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order. In the third encyclical of his pontificate, Benedict denounced the profit-at-all-cost mentality of the globalized economy, and he lamented that greed brought about the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. The document, entitled Charity and Truth, was released just hours before the G8 summit gets underway in Italy. The pontiff stressed that he is not opposed to a globalized economy, saying that if done correctly, it has unprecedented potential to redistribute wealth around the world. But he did warn if globalization continues on the current path, modern societies risk increased poverty, inequality, and further environmental damages. Six, six, six. What does it mean? For many people, just saying the number conjures up ominous images of secret occult ceremonies and the evil powers of apocalyptic prophecies. Others have refused phone numbers, license plates, and even credit cards that might contain the number 666 because of their fearful superstitions. For many years, Highway 666 running from Gallup, New Mexico to Monticello, Utah was named the Devil's Highway because of the scripture that identifies the number with the beast of Revelation. This satanic connotation, combined with an unusually high fatality rate, convinced some people that the highway was cursed. The problem was compounded because Satanists, or somebody, was chronically stealing the highway signs as souvenirs. So in 2003, the U.S. Highway Department decided to rename Highway 666 as U.S. Route 491. The Bible says, Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Revelation 13, 18.